Well, we had Nancy over for dinner. You got it. And uh, she took an interest in an etching it's hanging right here, which is hanging in our front hallway. <clears throat> and she asked about it. And of course, you never ask an obsessive compulsive personality <laughs> about anything that they're really enthusiastic about. So I, we began to talk about, <laughs> talk about Kati Kalvitz. And um, toward the end of this, as she was leaving, she said, well, you know, uh, would you, maybe you ought to talk to the Art League about uh, Kalvitz. And I said, yeah, sure. And uh, thinking that we were going to get together with five or six of us and have coffee. <laughs> and about a week later, I got a letter in the mail saying, this is to confirm our arrangement. Um, and we're looking forward to having you on May 18 or 16, whatever it was. And uh, then that was followed by a telephone call from Kathy Burdick to um, confirm the whole business. Now, um, I noticed somewhere um, that this was billed, maybe it was in the newspaper, this was billed as being a talk about uh, Kathy Kowitz and her um, uh, etchings or her works on paper. Well, let me tell you, that's not what it is. Uh, I want to talk about Kowitz and her, uh, it, how she fits in to German Expressionism. And while it's true that her graphic works are what she's known for in this country, in Europe she's known primarily for her sculpture. And she was truly a magnificent sculptress. Now I'm going to start by going to the conclusion first and tell you where we're headed. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kowitz's life. I know some of you know quite a bit about it already. But for those who don't, I'm going to talk about Kowitz and how she fits into things. And then the bulk of this is going to be looking at Kowitz's works. So first, the conclusion. My conclusion is never ever in this world or the next, invite Nancy to dinner. <laughs> and if she comes to your door pleading that she's hungry and hasn't eaten for a week, take, before you let her through the door, take all the artwork off the walls and put it in a closet. You will regret it a word to the wise. Now, um, Kawas was um, let's start here. Kawas was uh, born with a, her maiden name, her birth name was Schmidt. And she was, her grandfather was um, Julius Schmidt, who was a uh, very well known clergyman in Germany, and he organized the, um, I guess it was called, for a time was called the Confessing Church. He, he was a rebel against the established church in Germany. And of course the church was ultimately responsible to the head of the church was uh, Wilhelm II. And he ran the church um, it was a, an agency of his government. And Julius Schmidt uh, formed this, uh, this church, and it was a liberal, uh, a liberal church. If you want to know more about it, um, uh, well, there's a lot. If you want to know more about it, there's a, uh, it, it has an interesting uh, 
it, it has an interesting history in Germany. And uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who I'm sure many of you will have heard of, and if you go to any of the uh, Protestant churches, it's very rare that in the course of a year you're not going to hear the pastor of the church quote Bonhoeffer at some point because he's an eminently quotable guy. And he, uh, f he founded, um, or he was important in developing the church during the period after World War I and going right up until the time when he was killed in 1945, and uh, uh, it, it was a very important movement in Germany. There was a difference between Bonhoeffer's view, though, and uh, Schmidt. Uh, Bonhoeffer believed that in the Christian faith, you need to stay out of government that there should be a complete separation of the, the church from government. And uh, his most important book is a piece uh, titled Letters and Papers from Prison. And it's one of the most important works, in my view, of world literature in the 20th century. It's a book everybody should have read. And one of the reasons is that it, as you thread through that book, he struggles with what to do <clears throat> about the government of Germany through the 1930s and into the 40s. And he was firmly committed to the belief that as a Christian, your religious beliefs should infect every thing that you do, every decision you make from the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed. But he believed you should stay out of government. His sister had married a Jew, and as, <clears throat> as the deportations started and things continued to get worse, um, he struggled with what to do about that and finally concluded that things were so bad that as deeply as he held this belief, you shouldn't mix your religious views. You shouldn't dabble in government. And he joined the plot to kill Hitler and <clears throat> eventually ended up, and ended up in prison where he sat for two and a half years without a trial. And then r right at the end of the war when things were winding down <clears throat> in 1945, um, Hitler gave the directive, don't bother with the trial, just kill him, execute him. And he was executed about two weeks before the war ended. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> Kalwitz died at approximately the same time. Uh, and so as I say, her, she um, was born with the surname Schmidt and she had uh, three siblings, her older brother, and she was closest to her, um, her sister, Lisa. And she was born into an upper middle class family. She led a, a quite a privileged life. They were able to afford to send her places for school. She took trips, went to Paris to see uh, the art there, made a trip to Florence to see the art there. She was, um, she lived, lived a, a privileged life. Then um, in, um, she met Dr. Kowitz, Carl Kowitz, um, and they were married just at the time that he got out of medical school and he went to start a medical practice in Berlin. Now, Germany at that time had a fairly extensive medical program for poor people, people who couldn't afford a doctor. And if you fell into that category, you could go to an agency 
where they gave you a voucher and then you took that voucher and you could go to any doctor you want or at least doctors who were accepting what I guess we'd call Medicare patients and he took up a residence in a part of Berlin which had basically only poor people lived in that area and they were people mostly who worked in the factories and these weren't factories that were like the factories that you and I think about today. Uh, there was a very extensive um, fabric industry and weavers, there, were some, there was a group called home weavers and basically what that meant was you literally did the work in your home. But the homes that most of these uh, weavers lived in were really just huge apartment complexes for the poor. And so there were families who were living in one room and in that room there'd be a big loom and that's where they made, uh, made their fabrics. So she, uh, in her diary, and by the way I, I bought a copy of her diary a couple of years ago. This is not on the bestseller list. But it, her diary was finally published, and it really is a, an eye-opener. Uh, and she talks about having, after she and Dr. Kowitz were married, uh, going and standing in the living room and uh, on the second floor and looking down and watching for people who were coming who, might, who would have one of these vouchers in their hands. And so he, they, he didn't make a lot of money as a doctor, but it was a comfortable life. And he absolutely loved his wife. She was able to do things all of her life. Um, her parents had encouraged her when she was, before she was married. After she was married, Dr. Kowitz saw to it that she had a furnished studio in the house. Uh, he arranged for child care for her. Uh, he encouraged everything she did, and as far as we can tell, uh, he, was very, uh, he was very proud of her. This is a photo of Kalvitz that was exact, almost exactly at the time that sh the photo was taken of Dr. Kalvitz. Um, they grew old together. And as we'll see, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kalvitz died in uh, 1942. So their marriage, it was a long marriage. They had two sons. Um, Hans was the older son and the younger was Peter. Hans is on the left here and Peter on the right. Peter joined the army in 1914, right after the war started. And he was killed uh, six, month, <clears throat> six months later. And it was a turning point in uh, Kathy Kavit's life. Um, she became a very, very active pacifist. And the rest of her life and much of her art is devoted to her pacifist beliefs. And right after he died, shortly after in 1914, she resolved to build a memorial to her son Peter. Uh, Peter was buried in a a cemetery for German soldiers who had died in Belgium. And she decided to build a, uh, a memorial that she was going to place in the cemetery. <clears throat> she worked on that memorial for the next 18 years. Her other son, <clears throat> Hans, lived, of course, and he had a son, and 
uh, his son's name was Peter also, and I, I assume was named for his dead uncle. <clears throat> and in 1942, uh, young Peter <clears throat> joined the army and was sent off to the Eastern Front and six months later was killed. Now, <clears throat> that was a, a bad year for Kathy Talvitz, 1942. If you know anything about the history of World War II, <clears throat> you know that that wasn't a good year for Germans generally. That was the year that the character of the war changed. The winter that on the Eastern Front that the Germans first began retreating, the army began retreating. Um, there was the horrible, horrible winter where they were thousands of men died. And it was the year that Karl Kalwitz became sick in January, closed his med medical practice, and died in June of that year. <clears throat> so that was a very, it was a bad year for uh, Germans generally. It was a bad year for Kathi Kalwitz. Now, during the time that she was married to Karl, she was able to do uh, a great deal of travel. She associated, she became world famous. And she had always been interested in Russia. And she took a trip to Russia. She had, always, she had identified, uh, she wasn't very active in politics, except, that, except for her pacifism. But she, um, uh, she liked R Russia. She identified with the Christian Democrat Party, which was a pretty far left of center political party. And um, there were, there was talk that uh, um, she was identified as a communist and she kind of had to, she said that she would, would have been a communist under other circumstances. And when she made her, she then made a trip to Russia where they loved her. Uh, there was a photograph, this photograph is of her associating with Russian artists. Uh, now that was in 1936, I think. And it was a time when the Molotov, Rubin, uh, Molotov uh, Pact was still in force. Germany and Russia were still allies. And the, there was a major conference of artists in Moscow, and she attended. And uh, she was lionized there. The largest delegation to that conference was uh, the German delegation. She, um, she was asked, this is from her diary, at one point she was uh, trying to explain why she became interested in a part of German life that was not part of anything she had grown up with. I mean, she didn't know anything about the worker, working class. Uh, this is all foreign to her. And she, she wrote in her diary, when I became acquainted, especially through my husband, with the difficulty and the tragedy of proletarian life, when I became acquainted with the women who came to my husband seeking aid, and incidentally also came to me, did I gra truly grasp in all of its power the fate of the proletariat, unresolved problems like prostitution and unemployment tormented and worried me and acted as the origin of my attachment to the depiction of the lower classes and their repeated representation 
offered me a vent or a possibility to tolerate life. Occasionally, my parents said to me, there are cheery things in life. Why do you only show the dark side? That I could not answer. It held no charm for me. Only I must repeat once again that originally pity and sympathy were only minor elements leading me to the representation of proletarian life. Rather, I simply found it beautiful. As Zola or someone said, the beautiful is the ugly. Now, the themes that you're going to see, I think, in the works of Kalvitz, there are some major themes that flow through all of her work. First of all, of course, and most importantly, probably, was her pacifism. Secondly, was the theme of poverty and the difficulty of the proletariat, the difficulty of life if you were poor. And thirdly, there was a, an especial feeling for women, the position of women in society. And um, I want to tell you that, I don't know, I hope nobody's going to be offended by this, but when we, uh, we Jenny and I used to have a uh, condominium in the Lincoln Park area in Chicago, and I used to spend some time prowling around the galleries and places in downtown Chicago. And there was a gallery in the downtown Chicago that only handled German expressionists. And so I saw in the, uh, in the reader, the Chicago reader, that they were, had mounted an exhibit of the works of Kathy Kalwitz. So I got on, we were down there for a weekend, I got on my bicycle, I pedaled down to downtown Chicago, and I went to this gallery, which was on the second floor of one of those uh, buildings in the Loop area. And the woman who was in charge of the gallery was a rather tall, blonde, blue-eyed, amply built woman uh, who spoke with a German accent. And so I walked around the gallery and, and I was looking at this material and she came over and started to talk to me about my thing. And in the course of this conversation, I said to her, you know, I'm surprised that American feminists seem never to have picked up with, on Kalwitz. Uh, you know, you would think that she would have a real appeal for American feminists. And this woman said, and I'm only quoting, she said, I shall tell you why. It is because of that. And she pointed to a piece that was hanging on the wall of a lovely mother and child scene, the mother holding her child. She said, and, and you'll see that one, and you'll see others like it. She did many of those. Mothers protecting in a protective stance toward their children. She said, it is because of that. That is what they don't like. They think they are liberated women. They just hate men. I do not hate men. I love men. And I have been a liberated woman all of my life. And I said, yes, ma'am. Uh, but there is, you know, there is something to be, I, I, I understand what she was saying. Um, Calvin saw the problems of women, and you will see in her work, uh, her empathy toward, about women. But at the same time, it's this woman in, who was talking at, in the gallery, she kind of had it right. Kalwitz was not a person who hated men. In fact, she had great sympathy for the poor, women especially, but also men. 
And in her diary, she wrote this, which I thought was telling. Frau Pankopf was here. She had a completely black eye. Her husband had gone into a fit of rage. The more I see of this, the more I understand that this is the typical misfortune of workers' families. As soon as the husband is sick and without work, the same thing happens. Either he hangs like a dead weight on his family, or he becomes melancholy, or goes mad, or commits suicide. For the woman, it is always the same misery. She maintains the children whom she must feed. So I think that's kind of typical of her. She was a feminist, but it was typical of her approach uh, to feminism. She saw that it is the proletariat German family that, that suffers. About the subject of her own political views, I think she would have joined the Communist Party until, probably until she made the trip to Russia. And in her diary, after that trip, she wrote this, I was a revolutionary. My childhood and youthful dream was revolution and the barricades. Were I still young, I would surely be a communist. Even now, something hangs over to that side, but I am in my 50s. I have, through the war, seen Peter die and thousands of other young men. I am horrified and shaken by all the hatred in the world. I long for the kind of socialism that lets people live and find that the earth has seen enough of murder, lies, misery, distortion, in short, all of these devilish things. The communist state that builds on that cannot be God's work. So I think that the, the trip that she took to Russia when she saw what communist-like life uh, under Stalin was, I think she changed her, some of her views about, although she said she would still be a communist. Um, Kowitz, um, Kowitz never got along with the establishment in Germany. It was true all through the reign of Wilhelm II, and after the coming of the Nazi party became even worse, um, she was eventually banned. Her work was banned in Germany. She was included in the uh, Museum of Degenerate Art that toured uh, Germany in the 30s. And she was, she lost her position. She had been uh, a professor at a school there. She lost her position. She was uh, banned from showing her work. That was under the Nazis. Under uh, the Kaiser, she, um, she exhibited uh, one of her early series. It was called the Peasant Revolt, and you'll see some of that. In fact, there's one of the series is uh, over here. Um, the judges for the uh, exhibition were blown away, uh, blown away and they recommended that she be given the gold medal. And that is a recommendation which, of course, goes up to the Kaiser. And he rejected it. He, he rejected giving her the medal. And he, ma he made a speech at about that time. And he said, even the lower classes after their toil and hard work, should be lifted up 
and inspired by the force of ideals. But when art, as often happens today, shows, shows us only misery and shows it to us even uglier than misery is anyway, then art commits a sin against the German people. It is descending into the gutter. Now, interestingly enough, when he made that statement, she became more famous than ever. <laughs> and they began to, the people, uh, her associates, they formed kind of a group. And they produced what they said was gutter art. And gutter art became a, a term in, in, in Germany. Interestingly enough, um, after, right after that happened, um, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, is reported to have said to one of his people that gold medals belong on the breasts of the men who uplift the German people. It should not be given uh, to a woman who produces gutter art. It was interesting that he used the men versus women, not just. And of course, uh, there really weren't any significant number of, or, or there were, uh, there was no one of Kalvitz's uh, stature uh, who, there were no women. Now, I'm going to whip through some of these uh, images because I, the most common image, if you took all the work of Kal Kathy Kalwitz and you put it on the wall, the largest number of her graphic works were self-portraits. There are about 42 Kalwitz self-portraits. Uh, this is an early self-portrait from um, right after her marriage to, uh, to the doctor. This is, uh, well, I've got these out of order. This is a, a, a self-portrait from uh, prior to the time that she married the doctor. And she, she produced literally, as I say, dozens of these. Uh, this was titled Self-Portrait at the Window. Yes? What mediums did she use? Um, well, um, early in her, the question was what medium was she using? Early in her career, she uh, almost exclusively did etchings. Now, she did some drawings, um, but, and she did some paintings but almost always etchings. And then she uh, later discovered lithography, and she loved drawing on a stone with a lithographic crayon directly on the stone. But she also did some what are called soft ground etchings, that, I don't know, or, uh, uh, and soft ground where, where you draw on a piece of paper and you put a soft ground on the copper plate as opposed to a hard ground. And then you put the drawing over the top of it and you draw and it, etch, it cuts into the soft ground. She did, she did some of that. So she did some of all of these things. Um, now these were all, many of were all earlier. She what? Did she ever say or write why she did so many self-portraits? No, I, not that I know of. Uh, I, I want to tell you, I'm not an expert on Kathy Cowitz. I'm here because I got canned, but I got conned by some crazy, crazy lady. But um, and I don't have a degree in art history, and I'm sure there are people here who probably know more about this subject than I do.
Now, uh, toward the uh, end of her life, she did this um, portrait of her husband, Dr. Kowitz, and she did this as a preliminary study for this, which was a self-portrait of her and her husband. Now, as I say, she also did these wonderful mother and child uh, things, of some of them relatively happy scenes, but always in, mothers for her represented protection. All of her drawings, all of her prints were of mothers in a protective uh, situation. And you'll find that later, when things turn so bad in her life and turn so bad in Germany, that uh, the mothers become even more protective. Now we start to get into some of the almost frightening. This was a um, this was a lithograph that's titled The Survivors. So that you have the children, fatherless children, the widow, and even the men who survived are blind. I have an interesting story regarding this that is local, and maybe some of you know something about this. This was titled Rape, and it was part of her poverty series. And um, you'll see some others uh, from the poverty series here. But it's hard when you just pass it quickly, it's even hard to see what the subject matter is, but it's, it's a woman lying in a pile of leaves who has apparently been raped by the landowner, the powerful guy. A number, of, many years ago, probably, I don't know, 15 years ago, was Gary still alive then? No. Okay, so it was longer ago than that. I was back in about 1988, 87, 88. I was directing a play down at URock and um, Gary Lennox was doing some work on it. He was a librarian down there then. I'm sure some of you knew Gary. And I went down to, and met him at his office in the library, and um, the dean wanted to talk to us because he was worried that a local police officer had made the statement that if we did this particular play that I was directing that he was going to come down and investigate and he would um, arrest the dean for, for allowing pornography in his institution. And so the dean sent the word out that he wanted to talk to Gary and to me. So I met Gary at his office and there was some kind of a heating tunnel or some kind of a tunnel with just cement walls that went from the building where the library is over into the old building where the dean had his office. And this, I think it was a heating tunnel or something, and it had bare bulbs hanging down this, this tunnel. And there were um, framed pictures hanging on the wall in this tunnel, this heating tunnel. Well, we go down there and we go walking along and we pass a print of this. A signed Cowitz print. I think these were things that people had given to, the, to UROC and they didn't know what to do with them. And so we stopped and I said, hey, wait a minute, that's a, that's a Cowitz. And he, we stopped and Gary looked at it and I, Gary didn't know the name Cowitz and I explained to him what it was and how it fit into how it fit into things. 
So we went on, we had our conference with the dean, went back. Then, oh, a couple months later, I had occasion to have to go down and talk to Gary about something else. And I walked into his office in the library, <laughs> and guess what was hanging on, <laughs> hanging on the wall? Does anybody know what happened to that? Somebody should investigate. I, I have no idea. After Gary died, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But anyway, there, you rock it, used to own a copy of this, a print of this. Uh, she produced as part of, this, of her, this poverty theme uh, these really gut-wrenching images of what it was like to live in poverty, that literally two men are, are pulling the plow which is being manipulated by the woman. Uh, this is a, this uh, print was titled um, Municipal, uh, Municipal Room, I think it was. It was a, a place where homeless people could go, go to sleep for the night. She titled this, Germany's, Germany's Children Are Hungry. Uh, this is from, this is from the mid-1930s. This was titled, Woman and Her Children Walking Toward Death. Uh, this is one of her more famous uh, uh, etchings. Uh, this was titled, Death Takes a Mother. And you know, your eye is imme immediately focused on the child. It's the mother who's being taken by death, but that's almost irrelevant. It's the child that's the center of the image. And the etching that Nancy was so interested in on our wall, which is over here, uh, this, was t this is titled uh, Woman at a Church Wall. And it's a bag lady. It's what it's like to be poor. This is also... Um, one of Calvitz's more famous images, and it's taken, the title of it is taken from a, worth, a work by uh, Goethe. Uh, it's titled, This Seed Corn Must Not Be Ground. <clears throat> and as she got later in her life, this, this business of the mother as being the protector it becomes, a, it, it, it gets stronger as she gets older. And of course, as things in Germany got worth, worse. This is kind of an interesting, um, I told you earlier that um, there were workers who made fabric in their home. They were called home workers. Well, you see, here's a woman and back in the back is a loom where Here's a family living in one room. You see here they've, here's where the, the uh, thread, I guess I shouldn't be pointing to this, should I? Here's where the, the, uh, the uh, and here's where the loom where the fabric is being made. They're all living in this one room and the father and another child back here and here's the dying child with the mother sitting next to it. This was part of her Weaver's Revolt series. There was an event that occurred, I think around um, 1858. It was well before uh, Kalwitz was born. But the Weavers literally revolted against a, uh, the owner of the mill. And this is the first of the series 
And it's, well, it's, it's titled um, um, Invading the Armory. They went in and they got weapons. And um, I find this a very disturbing image. It's titled Woman Sharpening Her Scythe. And there's really nothing, that should be nothing about that that would be disturbing. But there's something about this woman where you think it's almost sinister. There's something sinister about her uh, sharpening her scythe. There was a woman, her, uh, she was known as Black Betty. And apparently she is a figure in German folklore. And she's the woman who urges everybody on, urges the troops on as they march on the home of the uh, mill owner. It's hard to see the, uh, on this uh, image because it's, it, when I scanned it, it came across too light, but there's, there's a woman up here above leading the charge. All of these images of, of the Weaver's Revolt and later uh, she did uh, uh, another series that, uh, that was similar. There's always a woman there somewhere who's leading things. And then, of course, it was a failure. The men all ended up either dead or in prison. And this was one of the last figures in the series as the men are all imprisoned. This was titled After the Battle. And it's the woman who goes through, it's an image of the woman who goes through and finds the, the, the dead after the battle was over. And the image of the survivors walking by as the dead are laid out. But one of the interesting things about her series of, that dealt with death and revolt is that the dead never seem to be the center of the image. You have the people who are walking by and looking at the dead. You have the parents, the parents of the dead, the children of the dead, the widows, but the dead are never the focus of her uh, work. She did this twi twice, once as a, you ask about what form she, got interested in woodcuts later in her life. And so she did it first as a lithograph, and then she did it as a woodcut. Uh, another woodcut uh, is titled The Widow. It's the, the widow of the soldier. It's, it's typical of her that she, she saw the real victims, not being the, peop the men who died on the battlefield. She saw the real victims as being the people who were left behind the widow with the child in her arms when the parents of the, the dead soldier. This was titled Fallen. And of course, it's the woman who has just gotten the news that her husband fell in battle. And of course, the child is almost once again, the center of the, the center of the uh, attention. This um, was a lithograph that was titled "Death Swoops for the Children." Once again, you have it, this is death coming for a mother. And she seems more terrified for her child than she does for herself. This is probably the most famous um, work that Kalvitz ever did. And it's titled, um, Mother with a Dead Child. And she did this, most of her, many of her uh, etchings she did in various states. So there may be five states of the same etching where 
She did it. She sold a batch of them. She redid the more stuff to the plate, sold a bunch of them. So it's very, very hard to identify where a particular etching fits in. And she didn't number them. She didn't number any of her etchings. The reason she said she wanted to work in graphic arts rather than in paintings is because she wanted, she wanted lots of them and she wanted them affordable to poor people. And, but uh, this is one of, the, I think, one of the earlier states of this etching. Um, a woman greeting death. And then toward the end of her life, she began to see death as uh, not all that scary. And she did a whole series where they are all titled Death Comes as a Friend. And, and you never see the figure of death. And death is not a scary person coming after you. You usually see just a hand reaching into the image. Woman wel welcoming death. Death comes as a friend. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. She did some woodcuts on the subject of death. One of her more dramatic woodcuts. So that, that's kind of, I've just given you a sample. She was very, very pro, uh, prolific in her graphic arts. But in, as I say, in Europe, she's better known as a, uh, for her sculpture. And this was very early in her life. Um, she did her um, seed corn, it must not be ground. She did it as a, she did two of these, uh, did it as a piece of sculpture. You see, once again, it's the woman protecting the children. Uh, this is her pieta. She, the, the mother holding the body of her dead soldier son. Uh, that's in the Kalwitz Museum in Berlin. And it's worth seeing, it's in a room, probably almost as big as this room. And it's the only piece there. It's right in the middle of the room, and there's a skylight over the top of it. Uh, life size. Self portrait. Uh, this was for a um, memorial to the uh, dead soldiers. But this whole, all of, many of these images, the mother protecting the child. Um, the, this is a table sculpture. It's bronze, yes. The parents. And uh, Mother with her two children. Mother with two children, it's titled. It was, uh, and it's bronze. This was Calvis when she was working on that particular image. Here she is again working on it. Now, I have just one last image for you to look at, and then I'm finally done. Um, I told you that she worked for 18 years on the memorial for her son, Peter, had to be placed in a, the cemetery in Belgium. And she and Dr. Kowitz went there to look at the cemetery and to figure out where they could place stuff. And if you know about 
uh, memorials that came out of World War I, they're almost all heroic. If you go down here to the uh, downtown Janesville, what is the, what is the World War I? It's the soldier throwing the grenade, going over the top. Um, memorials usually um, were of the important people, the generals and one other. Well, it took her 18 years to, she did numerous plaster, model, plaster models or clay models. She revised it. You could do an hour's looking at, there are all kinds of pictures that she took of these things. And typical of Cowitz, when she finally got it done, the memorial <clears throat> is not of the soldier. It's not of the fallen, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not of the fallen soldier. She titled it, <clears throat> The Grieving Parents. And I saved this for last because for me, this is the most important thing she ever did. And it incorporates all of the themes of her life in this one very important piece of work. First of all, it deals with poor people. These aren't, <clears throat> these aren't important people. These are the least important people in society. It deals with poverty. Secondly, it, she says something in this work that I think was so typical of her. I think if there was ever anybody in the history of the art world who understood gender differences, it was Kathy Cowitz. She understood that there is a difference between men and women. Now, that's not a popular idea in, madam, in modern American culture. And we think you ought to be able to decide that you're really not a woman at all. You're a man, a woman, man trapped in a woman's body and all that baloney. But she understood that there are differences. There are gender differences. And if you look at this image, one of the ways that, images, that, that there's a difference in genders is the way we handle grief. If you look at that woman, if you actually saw her in the flesh, what would you do? Or what would you try to do? You would run over to her, you'd put your arms around her, <clears throat> You'd tell her things are going to be all right. You would comfort her. What would you do with this guy? You wouldn't know what to do. Because, I mean, you couldn't run over and put your arms around him. It would be like hugging a telephone pole. <laughs> the angle doesn't show very well here, but there's a, the hand over here digs into the arm. Over here, the hand is digging into the waist. His jaw. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, over here, the hand is digging into the arm. The hand is digging into the waist. His spine is ramrod straight. His jaw is set. The muscles in his face are, are hard. If you ever tried to comfort him, you wouldn't know what to do. And if somehow you could break through that, you wouldn't be doing him a favor. He'd collapse. The only, <clears throat> the only reason that he can deal with the grief is because, by God, I'm a man. And it seems to me that college, for, and, and there is, so the theme of poor people, the tragedy of war, the theme of death, 
the differences in gender, it seems to me all of these things come together in what I think is Kalvitz's greatest work. Thank you.